In this short video, we're going to talk about the precise definition of limit. Now, recall our informal definition of the limit. We said that uh, if we had a function that was defined when x was near the number a, not necessarily when x equals a, we would write the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l if we can make the values of x arbitrarily close to l by restricting x to be sufficiently close to a. Now, some of the phrases in here, like near the number a, or arbitrarily close to l, or restricting x to be sufficiently close to a. Those are not very mathematically precise. So let's look at a definition which does have the mathematical precision that we need. Let f be a function defined on an open interval containing the number a, but not necessarily at a itself. We write the limit as x approaches a, f of x equals l, provided that for every positive number epsilon, there is a positive number delta such that whenever the absolute value of x minus a is between zero and delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So in other words, we can ensure that f of x lies between l minus epsilon and l plus epsilon. That's what we mean by arbitrarily close whenever x lies between a minus delta and a plus delta. And so that's what we mean by sufficiently close to a. Now, let's draw a picture of what's happening here. What this says is that if we have, if we have a limit value l and we want to ensure that that is indeed the limit value for the function, then what we can do is draw a band around L. So this rectangle, which it goes from L up epsilon and then down epsilon. And then the graph of the function should be trapped in that band. And if I look at uh, the X coordinate of the point where the function, the graph of the function enters and leaves the band, those x coordinates would be a distance from a, and they may not be the same on either side, but I could just choose the smaller value, and that would be my delta. As long as x is in that vertical, or the x coordinate is in that vertical rectangle, then I'm assured that the y coordinate is going to be in this horizontal rectangle. So sometimes we think of this limit definition as having a prover and a skeptic, right? The prover says, I believe the limit as x approaches two of x squared plus three equals seven. Well, the skeptic doesn't take that at face value. So the skeptic will provide a tolerance. This is what our epsilon value is. How close do we want to be to that limit value? And so the skeptic will say, make x squared plus three be, I should say within, let me make a quick correction. be within 0 0.001 of 7. All right, 
So our provers then comes up with a value for delta. So the, our epsilon, our first epsilon chosen is the 0 0.001. So our prover says, hey, no problem. As long as X is restricted to values within 0 0.00002 of two, then uh, we're going to be assured that uh, X squared plus three is within this distance of seven. And that happens to be true. So we've chosen a delta to ensure that the function value is within epsilon of the limit value. So the, the skeptic says, fine, that's only one value of epsilon. I'm gonna choose one even smaller. How about 10 to the minus 16? So we have a new choice of epsilon. And the prover doesn't even break a sweat. That's fine. I'll restrict X to be within one fifth of 10 to the minus 16. And so, and this could go on forever. No matter how small epsilon is chosen, the prover must be able to find a corresponding value of delta, which ensures that by restricting X to be within that tolerance of A, the number A, that the function value will be within epsilon of the limit value L. So our key idea, if we are going to show that the limit exists and the limit equals L, is we'd like to be able to find a delta, a formula for delta, which ensures that F of X minus L is less than epsilon. So let's see how our prover came up with his values of deltas. So we're gonna to try to find a delta such that whenever the absolute value of X minus two is between zero and delta, then uh, the function value X squared minus three minus the limit value seven should be smaller than 0 0.0001, one ten thousand. All right, so again, f of x here is x squared plus three. Our limit value L is seven, and our epsilon value is one ten thousand. So one small note here, we always have this zero on the left-hand side, and all that says is that we don't ever expect x to equal to if we're taking the limit as X approaches to. So we're gonna start by just taking our function value minus the limit value and doing some simplification. We collect the like terms and then we can factor it. We're gonna have X squared minus four, the absolute value of that equals absolute value x plus two times absolute value x minus two. So our new inequality is absolute value x plus two times absolute value x minus two is less than one ten thousand. So now here is an important point for this particular question. Since X is going to be close to two, we know that the absolute value of X plus two is going to be, well, certainly no smaller than one. And um, no greater than five. I mean, we may be off by, you know, far away from X, we may be at 2.5, maybe at 2.75. I take 2.75 and add it to two. And um, I'm not gonna ever get more than five. So that's an important idea there. 
So I can say that, well, absolute value of x plus two times the absolute value of x minus two should be less than five times the absolute value of x minus two. Now, why is that important? Well, really, you know, our target involves the absolute value of x minus two. There's no absolute value of x plus two, and we can't come up with a value of delta that is dependent upon x. So replacing this absolute value of x plus two with five, now is going to simplify our calculations. All right, so now I would just like to have five times the absolute value of x minus two less than one ten thousandth, or, well, that would mean the absolute value of x minus two should be less than one fifth of one ten thousandth. And that would be my choice for delta. Now, I've got a choice for delta, but just having a choice for delta is not enough. I need to verify that the chosen value of delta works, meaning that if I have this inequality, and, and again, I should be a little careful here because I should say that x is never going to equal to, so I'm going to say that absolute value of x minus two should be between zero and one fifth of point zero 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 one. So if I have that uh, inequality, well, I'll start just as I did before. I'm trying to show that f of x minus l is less than 0 0.0001. So I'll start off with f of x minus l. I'll do the algebra that I did previously. I'll make the same substitution I did previously. And I'm able to do that because since x is close to two, I can say that x plus two in absolute value will be less than five. And I have supposed that uh, the absolute value of x minus two is less than one fifth of one ten thousandth. So if I put all of that together, I'm going to get that the absolute value of x squared plus three minus seven is going to be well, less than, less than, less than five times one fifth of one ten thousandth, or combining that all together, x squared plus three minus seven in absolute value is less than one ten thousandth. Now that was a lot of writing. Normally we don't have to write all of that. We can just simply write it as a string of equations and inequalities here and get to the conclusion in a much shorter uh, span of writing. So now, let's see. You know, there's nothing special about what we did with 0 0.001. So I could do this in general for a general epsilon. So I could go ahead and replace the 0 0.001, let's go ahead and erase that, and replace it with epsilon, a general epsilon. So all of the algebra stays the same. All right, again, I'm gonna replace this numerical value for just the letter epsilon. It's still going to be true that when x is restricted to values close to two, we can say that the absolute value of x plus two is less than five. So now, 
in the next inequality, I can still replace the numerical value with the letter epsilon. which says that I should choose delta to be one-fifth of epsilon. And with this given value of delta, then uh, I should be able to use the same steps to prove that F of absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So let me go ahead and make my replacement. So I'll replace that numerical value with the letter epsilon. And this would be a formal proof showing that the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 3 equals 7. Well, this is only part one of our formal definition of the limit. I'm going to have a second video with more examples, and we're going to look at the formal definition of infinite limits and one-sided limits.